time. But let's read verse 25. We want to quickly go over and uh, just kind of review, kind of set the table uh, for where we're going today. Verse 25 simply says this, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approach. And remember, from this verse back at the beginning, we saw that we are to be moved, resolved, committed, so much the more to not neglect the assembly, the gathering together of God's children, uh, the family of God here on earth. And if we're going to be committed to that, then we uh, so much the more, then we've got to understand what, what is it that's uh, supposed to take place. What is it within that assembling, that gathering together, that we are to commit to even more? And uh, that's really the key. What, what is supposed to happen so much the more when we gather together as we commit to that? Verse 22, start us off. Remember this? Uh, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, okay? So from this, we simply re realize, hey, let us draw near. We are to assemble, to experience, and enjoy the presence of our Savior, and what a joy that is every time. Verse 22 goes on to say, hey, let us, draw, let's do that with what? Well, a sincere heart, an assured heart, a heart whose conscience is free of conviction and a cleansed and consecrated body. Verse 22 makes that clear. Then last Sunday, verse 23, what did we learn? I didn't really put this in the, uh, on the slides last week, but essentially our gathering together is both an expression of an encouragement to steadfast faith. Verse 23, notice it, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that is, uh, that has promised. The point is clear, obviously God uh, wants us to hold tightly to our faith and hope in him, and there's two ways that Paul says that's going to happen as we gather together. Two ways that that's going to uh, allow us and encourage us and support us in holding fast our faith. The first is this, it strengthens us to hold on to it. We talked about maintaining that firm grip on our faith, and uh, boy, coming together on a, on a Sunday morning and coming together when we gather together, man, it just encourages us to hold on to our faith. And then secondly, we saw this, it prevents us from wavering in our faith. That word wavering means to not bend. And uh, boy, it seems like every week you hear of somebody bending in their faith, giving in, letting go of their faith one way or another, bending, and boy, gathering together, studying God's Word, meeting with God, coming into the presence of God, boy, it solidifies us and helps prevent us from wavering. So we made a simple statement here that coming and assembling together is so crucial in building us up. Paul said, exhort one another, verse 25, so we don't bend to the pressure to forsake our faith or to hide our faith. How crucial that is, and the church helps us to do that. We also said this as we brought it to a close. The reality is when we do so, we're speaking something loud and clear. I still believe. I have faith in Christ. Every time we come to church, it is proclaiming, it is sending out an announcement, I still believe. I have faith in Christ. We say uh, that every time we attend, and I love this statement. I added a little bit to it even for today. Those of faith, Paul's saying this, those of faith will gather at the house of faith when the family of faith is assembled to do what? To build our faith. To build our faith. That's why we gather, to, to, to be built up in our faith so we hold fast to it. Crucial. Last week, then, we just simply ended with this. What are the takeaways? Well, we gather because we want to affirm, I believe. My hope is Jesus. And it always will be. Secondly, we gather together because uh, both God and us, we, we, be, uh, we want us to be strengthened today. May I just encourage you right now, this moment, listen to me, believer. God wants you strengthened today. God wants you to be strengthened, encouraged, and lifted up, and uh, bolstered in your faith and trust in him. And then uh, lastly, we gather today to show and to ensure in the days ahead that we will not waver in our faith that we will be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? Because our labor is not in vain. Amen? So we don't want to waver. We don't want, don't want to bend. And we want 2021 to be a great year of doing it so much the more. We don't want to waver. Okay, so now let's finish it up. Let's look at this passage and let's understand there's another uh, thing that Paul adds. And yet, it's very interesting in its uniqueness compared to the other two. Look at verse 24. Let's read it together. Verse number 24, we read this. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Okay, so we have our three statements. Some have called it the... Uh, uh, the Christian's garden, right, of lettuce, okay? Let us do this, let us do this, and the last one, let us consider one another to provoke into uh, love and to good works, all right? So the reality is that statement we have, let us draw near, let us hold fast, and let us consider one another. 
Now I want you to see this morning, do not miss it, there is a decided change in the focus of our action. That is to say there's a change in the one who is the primary beneficiary of this important and vital ingredient of gathered together. It's important for us to grasp this truth. Okay? It's just so many will miss this. There are Christians who, who will not glean and understand. Now, wait a second. When I gather together, there's another aspect of this, and it kind of changes its focus. It kind of changes who is the primary beneficiary. You see, in drawing near to God and striving to come into his presence to enjoy and experience it, you see, I am the beneficiary. I'm the primary beneficiary when I draw near. I, I get to reap the benefits of coming into his presence. And I just tell you what a joy it is for you and I to come into a service like this. And listen, we get to enter into the Holy of Holies. We've seen that. Going back to verse 19 and following. May I also encourage you when you and I come to a service and we come into the presence of God, you and I get our own experience at the burning bush. Amen. You and I get our own road to Damascus in which we get to see God and experience him personally. Uh, we, as the old hymn puts it, you and I get to enter into the garden with him. Spend some time with him. We get our own time of sitting at his feet and learning of our God just as the disciples did. We get our own chance, just like the disciples on the road to Emmaus, to walk with him and to, to glean and to learn from our Savior. This is our time to come and draw near. And my goodness, how many times we said, boy, what a joy it would have been to sit on that, that countryside, that mountainside, and sit at the feet of Christ and just hear him speak and teach and watch his miracles. What a joy that is. What a joy it would have been to walk with those disciples on the road to Emmaus and hear him explain the whole Old Testament and into the New Testament and why those things had to be. What a joy it would have been to stand at that burning bush and hear God speak. May I tell you every time that you and I come to church, it is our burning bush. It is our road to Damascus to see our Savior. It is our time at his feet and our time to walk with him. And what do we reap? What do we gain in those moments that we draw near in the presence of God? Well, those stories in the scriptures tell us the very first thing is this. We never leave the presence of God the same way we came in. We never leave the presence of God the same way we came in. You can talk about the Moses. You can talk about Paul. You can talk about those disciples. You can talk about those disciples on the road to Emmaus whose whole countenance and attitude changed. They're walking. They're glum. They're disappointed. They're sad and they're heartbroken. Christ speaks with them. They see Christ and guess what? They turn tail and run back to tell the disciples what the great news. Everything's changed. And I tell you, every time that you and I enter into the very presence of God, you can't help but leave change. When we enjoy and experience the very presence of God. Secondly, the psalmist also says there's another benefit to it. Don't miss it to, uh, this morning. I think it's so good. Psalm chapter 10, or 16, excuse me, verse 11. In his presence, I find direction of life, fullness of joy, and pleasures evermore. Notice what the verse says. Thou will show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures evermore. Isn't that great? I, I, we come and we enter into God's presence. No matter what happened this morning to you, the reality is this. In God's presence, guess what? I can find direction for my life. I can find fullness of joy and pleasures evermore. You see, you may have entered here and this morning everything that transpired in your life was not very joyful. Uh, the events of this morning, the events of this week may not have been fullness of joy. Some of you may have had something go wrong. Can I tell you, even the church is not void of having things go wrong. You know this morning, you may not know it, but our water softener kind of blew up on the other end. So if you taste the water and you say, boy, this is hard, you're right. Okay, and we all have things go wrong. We all have issues and problems that come up that arise in life. And you may have had issues today. Your car may not have started. Your child may not have started, amen. He may not have got out of bed. That may have had, hey, the reality, we, we, there are things in life that don't bring fullness of joy. Hey, but isn't it, a, isn't it a great delight that you and I can come into the presence of God and experience fullness of joy? We get to experience that. And boy, you want direction for something in your life, where's it found? In the presence of God. You want to enjoy pleasures forevermore, where's that found? In the presence of God. And this morning, when you and I draw near unto him, as we've gathered in his house to worship him as fellow believers, wow. We get to experience and enjoy his presence, and I benefit from that. I, 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 
I tell you, if you don't leave more joyful and changed after coming to service, there ain't something wrong with God. There's something wrong with you. Because there's joy to be found. There's encouragement to be found. There's change to be found in the very presence of God. And you and I reap it. Man, that is a good haul, friend. You and I are the recipients of that benefit. Then when we come to church, and uh, based on that verse 23, when our faith is fortified and strengthened, we get to reap the benefits of that. My faith is strengthened. I'm ready to face all that the weak and the world holds for me. I'd put it this way. When we come and we draw near and our faith is strengthened and so forth, I get to come away strengthened and encouraged. I get to come away with my faith being strong and ready not to waver in the face of all that my enemies throw at me. That's what we reap. And boy, that is so crucial. In the last few weeks, we've emphasized, hey, this is why we don't want to forsake the assembling of ourselves together so much the more because we reap so much from that. There is so much to be gained. I'm thankful for that. But verse 24 changes everything. We are not to consider what we are to gain, not how I will benefit, but rather to consider one another. That is, Paul's saying that someone else is the primary beneficiary of this vital part of gathering together. So, okay, so as I gather together as a believer, now it isn't just about me drawing near to Christ and enjoying experiencing his presence. It not, it's not just me about holding fast my faith, but there's also an element where I need to consider one another. Now I've come together to, uh, to uh, in a sense of perceiving others. My job is not to come in, walk in the door, find my spot, and be ready to just soak it all in like a, like a sponge. And then to walk out without consideration of anyone else. The idea that Paul's speaking of here is getting our eyes off of ourselves and view the needs of others. Have you ever been around, many of us certainly have, have you ever been around teenage boys at dinner time? It's a fun experience. I'll rent some out to you if you want. You know what sometimes happens, especially in a youth group or whatever the case is, I appreciate Pastor Tony and Diane, and they had a teen activity last night. I appreciate all the work they put into it, and you don't often know all that goes into it. And I appreciate all their work and efforts for doing so, but uh, teen activity is the same thing. You can have teenage boys, and you know what, at dinner time, uh, certainly we've experienced it, and, uh, both as a youth pastor and as a father. You know, sometimes you, you, know, you sit down, you pray, and, and boy, they can go at it if they're helping themselves, and you're like, wait a second, do you realize there's others of us here? Are you going to leave something for us? Yeah, you, you do realize the rest of us would like to eat, right? It's why as a youth pastor, I hardly ever have the, the teenage boys go first in line, because if I did, there'd be nothing left. I had a few teenage girls like that, but we won't go there. Yeah, now listen, why, why, yeah, no, I don't want them to go first, because you need to realize and be, you know, teaching your children, be cognizant there's other people around, and be perceptive that, that I, I need to think of others, and that's exactly what Paul is saying here. You know, a teenage guy may think with his stomach, and when he thinks with his stomach, he doesn't think of anybody else, amen? All they can think about is themselves. Paul doesn't want us to be like that. He says we are to be focused on not just what we can get out of it, but what we can give. We have gathered today not just to draw near. That's important. We have come not just to be encouraged and strengthened, holding fast our faith. But friend, listen to me. We have gathered today to consider one another. To consider one another. To be perceptive of the needs of others. It's looking out for others. Dividing my time between what I can get out of it and what I can give to others. One of the great indicators of spiritual maturity is getting our eyes off of ourselves and encouraging others. I can just imagine Paul's writing this and he's penning this to the Hebrews and he's saying, man, as I visited churches, there's some that I have noticed that, that they have a custom or a manner of forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And he says, so listen, friends, don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. There's some of you that have this custom. You have this manner of skipping what is one of the most necessary and greatest helps, aid, supports that any Christian can have. And my friend, it's not just about you missing out on something. Listen to me. It's about others missing out on something when you're not here. And boy, in our, our selfish, self-centered society and culture today, boy, we don't like that. 
when we're not there, we think we're the only ones missing out, or it's not that big of a deal because I, I'm the only one that it hurts. No, friend, it hurts the church. We're to consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. See, perhaps these that he thought of that were missing services occasionally, the gathering together now and then, perhaps they thought they didn't need the church and the church didn't need them. Well, Paul is making it crystal clear, and do not miss it, as he does in other contexts and other passages. No Christian is an island unto himself. No Christian uh, is one uh, who is a lone ranger. There's no lone rangers in Christianity. There is nothing in the Bible that says a Christian ought to be willfully go it along. You, you experienced this? Have you experienced this in your house? Erica's done a great job in making a meal, and it's prepared, and we're sitting on the table, and, and the, the call goes out. Dinner's ready. Everybody needs to come. Dinner's ready. And have you ever, ever sat down at the table, and you're looking around, and all of a sudden you notice that one chair is empty? Where is so-and-so? And you're like, man, we, we, we need to get started, and we need to get this done. Boy, everybody ought to be here because we're sitting down as a family, and we're ready to dig in. And invariably, one of the hungry kids says this, can we just pray? And mom and dad are like, no, we got to find them. They need to get here. They need to be here. Can I tell you right now, every service ought to be that way spiritually. Where you and I, as the family of God, we're gathering around the table. It's time to eat. It's time to draw near to God. It's time to hold fast our faith. Uh-oh, we're so-and-so. And you know what sometimes happens when one of our children may be late to dinner or lunch, whatever the case may be, I'll, I'll say, hey, you're holding everybody else up. We've been waiting on you. Maybe we'll say this. Hey, son, it's not the same without you. And friend, it's not. And Paul is trying to make a point. Trying, Paul is trying to make it clear. Wait a second, friend. Something's missing when you're missing. Did you get it, Christian? Something is missing when you're missing. Yes, we're to draw near so I can enjoy and experience the presence of God. Yes, we are to uh, gather together so we can hold fast our faith, be strengthened and encouraged in doing so so that we don't waver. But friend, just as important is that you and I gather together to do what? To provoke one another. To consider one another. And that's really what Paul says. Okay, so that begs the question. All right, Pastor, and I get it. I understand. I need to be here not just for myself but for others. But how do we do that? How do we consider others? What action is the flow out of me thinking about someone else when I gather together, when I come to a church service, when I consider? What's the outcome of considering one another? Paul says it in the verse, right? We are to provoke. Man, I love that word, don't you? It's a great word. I have joked before that if you have brothers and sisters or maybe if you have children of your own, you know how to provoke, amen? Okay. If you had brothers, you know how to provoke. I find this interesting, don't you? The Bible in two different places tells dads, don't provoke your children. One says to anger, one says to wrath. And that's interesting because you know what the Bible assumes? Fathers know how to provoke their children there's no explanation of what that means it's just a dad does a pretty good job he knows how to get his kids going i know my dad used to do that he could get me going and uh, say something do something kind of do it. i know i can do it for my children we know what provoke me i've told you before that growing up my older brother my only brother he is not a touchy filly kind of guy yeah he just he was never like that and so i know i knew one of the ways i could provoke him was just go give him a big hug He'd be like, let go, Stephen. <laughs> I'm like, no. <laughs> You're my brother. I love you. And now if I really wanted to get him going and start World War III, I'd kiss him. I'd just plant one right there. Oh, man, you talk about provoking. World War III would not I'm telling you, he hated that. And I knew it, man. I knew what button to push. I knew exactly how to get him going. And, boy, he hated that. You see, this word means to provoke, and it also means this, and I think this is crucial, it means inciting another to do something. We hear a lot about inciting in the news right now. I think there's a bad uh, definition of that out there. Anyway, so inciting, okay, now listen, we know what that means, right? Getting something, inciting something to do something, saying something, doing something to incite, to provoke somebody to do something. 
That's exactly what Paul. This word also means to stimulate another to produce fruit. To stimulate, to encourage, to, to say the right things, to do the right things, to get somebody to produce fruit in their life. Verse 25, Paul also added what? Exhorting one another, building up, encouraging one another. All of those things go into this idea that Paul says provoke one another. Would you provoke one another today as you're here at church? Would you find somebody that you can provoke in this way? That's what Paul's encouraging us to do. Don't come in here and sit like a bump on a log without interacting with somebody. Provoke someone else. This is why we gather together. You see, Paul then goes on to mention what? Have two specific goals in this provoking. I'd encourage you. It's always a good reminder. You ought always to have a reason for what you do. Amen? So Paul gives us that. He says, this is when we're considering one another, when we're provoking one another, there's two things to bear out. The first is this, provoke one another unto what? Unto love. Now, it's interesting Paul would point this out in one sense, but in another sense, it makes all the sense in the world. It, it, it's clear why Paul would say, oh, yeah, do that. So why does he make it such a great priority? Well, the first reason that he does is because we don't naturally love. We don't automatically love in a biblical sense, an unconditional sense. And about the only love that we know is a self-love, the Bible says. We're good at looking out for me and taking care of me, putting me first, and that self-love mentality. We're good at that. Yet Paul says, no, 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 provoke one another unto love in this biblical sense. Do you realize it's exactly why love is commanded in the scriptures so many times? 13 different occasions in the scriptures, in the New Testament, in 12 different verses, you know what we are commanded? Love one another, 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 13 times. That's a lot in the New Testament. For him saying, hey, you need to love one another. You need a purpose and focus on loving one another. It's crucial that you love one another. So why does Paul say, let's get together and provoke one another? What should we provoke each other to, Paul? He says, first thing, love. Make sure you're loving one another. And not just a love for each other, but did you catch this? I mean, this is what the scriptures teach. Our obedience in Christian duty is wrapped up in our love for God, for him, and in our love for others. True concept and very important in the Christian life. Our obedience and Christian duty is wrapped up into our love for God and our love for others. How do we derive that? Well, Christ himself said it best in Matthew chapter uh, 22. That should say 22, sorry. Ch chapter 22, verses 37 through 40. Jesus said unto them, unto him, thou shalt love the Lord thy God. We're asking now, what are the greatest commandments? What, what's the greatest instructions? What's the greatest means of obedience to God and showing him that I, I want to please him, I want to live for him? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Then he goes on and he says this, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Wow. Is there any reason why Paul said, listen, when you get together, provoke, stimulate, incite one another to love, to love one another, to love God, because your obedience is key to that. It's wrapped up, and your Christian duty is wrapped up into that. Then, what does Christ add? Well, we are familiar with this verse, John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now, now it's wrapped up even more. It's obedience. This is obedience to God's commands. If you love me, you're going to do it. So it's wrapped up. This love. So we're to provoke one another into love for God. Then he says, what's the calling card of every Christian? John 13, 35. Uh, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one for another. Would you understand today that when we come to live in the Christian life, our Christian duty, our Christian obedience to God is all wrapped up in love? Love for one another, love for God. And so Paul says, my, when you gather together, don't you provoke somebody to hate? Don't you provoke somebody to dislike? Don't you provoke them to anything like that? No, you provoke one another unto love. Crucial. Then he goes on. He says, there's a second area we need to provoke each other, and that's this, good works. Provoke one another into good works. We're to, to simulate it. Oh, let me just. That's supposed to go back. I'm sorry, my slide is in the wrong position. 
Ah, there we go, okay? Provoke unto good works, all right? And uh, uh, we are to stimulate one another, to incite one another to do good works, to produce the fruit, here's the key, produce the fruit of the Christian life. It's crystal clear, okay? Very crystal clear. Ephesians chapter 2, we know verses 8 and following. For by grace are you saved through faith, then not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Verse 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then what do we have in verse 10? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, uh, which he hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now that's crucial. We're saved. And God says, then what follows closely on our salvation is the reality that we've been ordained. God has designed us. God has made us to walk in Christ unto what? Good works. Producing the fruit of the Christian life, we might put it as such. It really blows a lid off someone getting offended when a fellow believer comes up and says, hey, how are your devotions going? Well, that's none of your business. Well, actually, biblically, it is. Well, how's your prayer life? Uh, Just leave me alone. I don't want to talk about it. Now, wait a minute. We're supposed to provoke one another into good works. The things that are supposed to be the natural fruit. Well, uh, how's things going with that situation? How's your attitude about this? Is your love being shown to that? We're supposed to provoke one another into good works. Hey, why don't you come out to visitation with me? Why don't you participate in this activity? We'll serve the Lord together. Let's do this. Provoking one another unto good works. That's our responsibilities. We gather together. Hey, how's that situation going in your life? Could I encourage you to do this? Maybe you should handle it this way according to what God says. Maybe this verse would apply some wisdom or share, uh, give you some wisdom how you should handle that in your life. Provoke one another unto good works. That's why we gather together this morning to stimulate, to incite one another. I like to think of it this way, okay? Many of us like to farm, and we like to uh, garden, whatever, grow something. Can I just tell you, bluntly, the church is to be the miracle grow that is sprinkled on every Christian when we gather? Okay, the church is supposed to be the miracle grow that incites you, that stimulates you, that pushes you, that provokes you and I to grow. And that's this. This is the church, you and I, fellow believers, moving in the midst encouraging, provoking one another to do what is right. My goodness, these two things are crucial. Provoking unto good works, and then I'm going to go back and show you that slide that I should have shown you then. A crucial end goal, making this a successful gathering, is that we provoke within one another a love for God, a love for others, and a love for the family of God. That calling card of every Christian. That's what God desires. And you and I are called to participate. We are called to contribute, if we could put it this way, to be that part of the miracle group, okay? You say, Pastor Henry, I get that, but how does that happen? How do I do that, okay? How do I come in on a Sunday morning, a Sunday night, a Wednesday night? How do I interact out in that foyer and, and, and I cause that to happen, okay? Mr. Solis, I want to use you for a second. Come on down. You should have just saw the look on his face. Death just showed up. Okay, come on up here, my friend. You stand right here, um, Ben. I'm gonna, brother Ben. I'm gonna need that on for him. Okay, so we can hear him too. Okay, how are you today? I'm doing good. Good. <laughs> that was the most untrusting look I've ever gotten on this platform. That's fantastic, though. Okay, <laughs> Mr. Solis, Mr. Brandon Solis. He's our third, and fourth grade teacher here at the academy. Good guy, and uh, really appreciate him and love him. Okay, so Mr. Solis, you're gonna help me out here. Okay, let's pretend that we're just meeting in church, okay? And so I just walked in, you're, you, you're here or whatever and so forth, and I'm coming up to you. Okay, so just, <laughs> it's going to be fun, yeah. Okay, so you just act normal. You, you normally respond how you might respond, okay? You with me? Okay. <laughs> you seem to have a question about this. <laughs> okay, just, just respond normally, okay? All right, so we're just in church. We're meeting each other, okay? Hey, Brandon, how you doing? I'm doing good, Pastor. Good. You want to ask me anything? How are you doing? Oh, good. Yeah. Okay, good. First step. Okay, just step back here for a second. We'll get back to you in a minute. Okay, now listen. Hey, th- this is important, you know. Have you ever asked somebody how you're doing? They're like, fine. <laughs> kind of like he just did. It was perfect. <laughs> I'm fine. Get me off the stage. <laughs> I want down and now. Okay, hey, can I just tell you, and I'm not being rude. I'm not being unkind. Listen to me. When we walk into church and you greet somebody and you're like, hey, how you doing? fine. Okay, good. I'm glad to hear. You know what that communicates? Now listen to me. I am probably so self-focused 
that I have not realized that you have a life too. And I said, well, Pastor Henry, that's kind of harsh. Said, Listen to me. When we gather together, our responsibility is not just to come and gain, it is to give. To consider one another. And this seems like a, such a simple interaction. Okay? Take two. Brother Brandon, would you stand right here, please? Hi, Brandon. How are you doing? I'm doing good, Pastor. How are you doing? Okay. Yes. Yes. Man, this guy listens to the sermon. Amen. Okay, now listen. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing great. Thank you. Hey, hey, I heard you. Uh, uh, did you have a difficult week? I heard you had a rough week. Did you have a rough week? Third, fourth graders? Uh, there were some challenges. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I can imagine that. I have one of them in my house. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Uh, so, uh, good. Is there anything I can pray for you about? Hey, stop, stop. Okay, we'll just give you a pause, okay? Good. <laughs> just stand over there. We're coming back to you, buddy, okay? Hey, listen, just a simple interaction. Hey, how are you doing? Now, we understand in our Baptist normality, how are you doing? I'm fine. When really, my whole week just went terrible. Okay, we do that. I get that. I say that too, okay? So I get that. So sometimes we've got to ask a little bit deeper, get a little bit deeper behind it, and, and so... We just try to find out what's going on in somebody's life because guess what? I want to provoke him unto love, okay? As much as you can love a third and fourth grader, amen? I want to provoke him unto good works, the things that he's having. Let's say Brother Brandon says, yeah, you know what? I'm facing a really challenging situation. I, I just don't know what to happen or what to do. Listen, you and I, not even a pastor, has to have all the solutions, but we can have God's word, Amen? So if he says, man, I, I don't know how to handle this situation, you know what I can say? Hey, I will pray for you in this one thing I am sure of. The Bible, God says, if any of you lack wisdom, let them ask of me. So Brandon, I'll be praying that God gives you wisdom. That, that situation will go well, that God will give you clarity of thought and understanding. And my friend, we all can do it. What do we just do in that? My goodness. Isn't it good for Brother Brandon to pray, yes or no? Yes. Is it good for, God, for Brandon to lean on God for his wisdom and direction in a situation in his life? Yes. Guess what I just did? I'm a provoker. I'm a provoker. I just provoked him into good works. I provoked him to love God and encouraging him, hey, turn to God, lean on God, depend on God. It's just a simple interaction that we have. It's not that you walk around in your Bible and you give every person you come to a sermon. No, we're just believers walking through life together. We're encouraging one another. I know if I told Brother Randy, yeah, I'm going through a difficult situation. He asked, how are you doing? And I said, oh, not good. He would say, no, oh, that's too bad. See you later. No, he would not. <laughs> and he would not. Brother Randy said, oh, I'm sorry. Is, what's wrong? Can, can I help you with anything? Can I pray with you about something? Just showing, considering one another. And then as things pour out of my heart in my life, he can provoke me into good works and unto love. It really is pretty simple, isn't it? But boy, how the devil wants to distract you and I when we walk in here to think, I'm just here to get this done and go back home. I'm just in here to get out of it what I want. And Wait a minute, that's not what God says church is. What gathering together is, we're supposed to provoke one another, consider one another, okay? Um, I'll give you a B plus. Go sit down. Thank you. You did a good job. Thank you, Brandon. Okay, that is just a simple illustration, a, a, a picture of, okay, hey, here's how we do that. Let me ask you this. When you come into church most often on services, are you really considering someone else? Are you really thinking about them? As you consider that, man, a simple conversation can just grow. And, man, I have found this out. Listen to me, please. I have found out that when I set out to provoke, to incite, to stimulate love and good works in someone else, it is often reciprocated. I know I've talked to people before, and I knew they had a burden in their life. They had a prayer request, and maybe I'd already been praying about it. Whatever the case, and I've gone and talked to them, and in talking to them, trying to encourage them, trying to provoke them into love and good works, man, they have done the same thing for me. I've walked away encouraged, uplifted, uh, myself provoked into love and into good works. They've expressed how they've looked to God, how they trusted in God in a situation. And boy, that's challenged me. That's provoked me to do the same in situations that I have. It's reciprocated. And my friend, that is how church is supposed to work. That's God's design. 
It's such an important teaching for today, isn't it? Verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another in so much the more as you see the day approaching. John Phillips shared a story in his commentary. He said this, I was brought up in Britain where most of the houses were not centrally heated. Instead, each room had its own small fireplace. I well remember the good fire that was always kept burning in the fireplace in the living room whenever the weather was inclement and cold. The coals would be heaped up and the the flames would uh, roar up the chimney. Occasionally, we'd take an iron poker and stir up the coals so that the air could circulate and the fire stay alive and hot. Once in a while, a a coal would fall down and go roll off to one side. When it first fell, it would be red and glowing with the fire. But after a while, after a short, a very short while, the isolated coal would lose some of its luster. The glow would fade, and it would look low and listless. Soon, it became black with just a wisp or two of smoke ascending as evidencing its former heat. Until presently, it was cold enough to be picked up by hand. See, I picture that Paul has something similar in mind. You see, we must exhort one another. We must provoke one another. We must stir up the fires of faith in one another so that we can burn brightly for the Lord. As you and I gather, we're trying to stir up each other, provoke each other to love and to good works, to stay, to keep our faith strong, to stay true to God. And yet we must stay close together through gathering faithfully to communicate and maintain Christian war that we all know it is. And you would have to agree with me on this. How sad it is when we've noticed maybe in our own lives and the lives of others that when we stop attending or we neglect the gathering that we begin to lose our fervor. We're not as hot as we ought to be about the things of God. We grow colder to the things of God and then soon we, we appear to be no different from the unsafe people around us, bearing no evidence of the life we have in Christ. Why is that? Why is it that we can get removed from the local assembly, we can stop gathering faithfully as we ought to, and and boy, it shows up religiously, and my fervor, and I grow cold to the things of God. No longer am I sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit, and, and soon, if not remedied, soon, if things don't change, then I can be no different than that cold coal sitting off to the side that someone can pick up that's no different than a coal that was never in the fire. And I can look like a... Uh, the unsaved, not much difference. Why is that? I think there's one more truth that scriptures bear out, and I think it explains why that is so. You and I can imagine what those disciples went through. It was a devastating day when Jesus Christ was taken up from them. He was, he was their whole life for three and a half years at least. And he was everything to them. And all of a sudden now he's looking up and the angels say, hey, just, just go. He'll, he'll come back. Go be about his business essentially. Yet it's devastating. You can imagine as those disciples are, are walking slowly back and they say, said goodbye to Jesus Christ in their minds for the last time. In their minds, they're thinking, what do we do now? Another thinks, how in the world are we going to do this? How in the world are we going to keep on going? How in the world are we going to be able to to maintain what he showed us? And boy, he was everything to us. He was the power behind it all. And he was the strength. He was the thing that kept us together. He was the thing that helped us to hold fast our faith in his, oh man, it was everything. They're walking away, their minds are racing, and the doubts are starting to creep up. And maybe someone says, man, we're all alone now. What do we have left? And maybe some one of them reminds them, wait a second. Remember when Christ was teaching us and he said he's not going to leave us alone? You remember what Christ said? You you remember him pointing out that he's going to give us everything that we need to live godly, to live lives that are pleasing to him, that when he leaves, we would have this? And then maybe they began to think upon what many of them would write of later. 
that God in heaven and his sovereignty, God in heaven and his graciousness, his love for you and I and for those men there and ladies there, he said, I'm going to leave you three things. I'm going to give you three things that are going to help you and aid you and support you as you go through this life while I'm in heaven and you're waiting my return. Now I'm going to give you some things to help you in this. We know first and foremost, he said his word. And boy, I am so thankful this morning that we have God's word, aren't you? He said, number two, I, there's a comforter that's going to come. And he's going to lead you and guide you into all truth. He's going to remind you of the things that I have taught you. He's going to guide and direct you. If you yield to him, he will help you through this difficult journey of life. And then you know what Christ said? I, I've given you one another. I've given you my church, the bride of Christ. You need these three things. These are your aid, your support, your help, your tools that, that I'm giving you because I'm going away and you need these things. Now let me ask you, what happens to a three-legged stool when you lose one of those legs? All I know is this, I don't want to be sitting in it because it tumbles over. Let me ask you this. What happens to a Christian when we neglect either God's Word, God's Spirit, or God's church? I would submit to you the very same thing. We are like a three-legged stool with a leg that's broken. We're not able to stand. We're not able to keep up. We're not able to do all the things we ought to do. We're not able to serve the purpose that we've been called to serve when we let one of those things slide truly is a shame when we try to stand and continue without the things, the three things that God said is vital for living this Christian life. It hurts us, and it hurts the church. There is great truth in this passage that I think is as vital as it's ever been. It's crucial that you and I focus on this for the entire year and the years to come. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together so much the more. There's been some things last year that got in the way. Those things will not get in the way this year. There's some things in the past that I maybe chose over God's assembly. I'm not going to do that this year. So much the more. Uh, let us draw near. When I come, it's not just going to be going to church. It's not just going to be wiping off or, or marking off the to-do list. No, no, no. I'm going to draw near to enjoy and experience the very presence of God. I want to hold fast. I want to leave here every time with my faith and courage and strength and so that I can go another week without wavering. I will not bend this year because I'm not going to forsake the assembly of ourselves together. Nothing else will replace it. And then let us consider one another. You know, in years past and days past, I've come to church and I haven't really given much thought to everyone else. Another person I'm supposed to encourage and I'm to provoke into love and good works. This year, 2021, so much the more. I will not leave until I consider someone else. I provoke them into love and to good works. And as Paul wrote, as you see the day approaching. Oh, friend, with every day that passes, don't we yearn for Christ's return? Man, oh, even so come, Lord Jesus. But in the meantime, I sure am thankful for the three things he's given us. God's word, God's spirit that indwells us, and God's church that surrounds us. Praise be unto God. Let's you and I take advantage of it so much the more.